Imagine you're camping with friends. You've reached the summit of the mountain. The sun has begun its gentle slip towards the horizon. You watch as it appears to dip below a sheet of stratocumulus clouds. Which are those clouds that look like the surface of a calm sea but from below. The wrinkles smolder and eventually the entire earth seems to sink into a beautiful pink burn that silhouettes everything in view. You close your eyes as a gust of wind throws your hair upward, and for a moment, the words in your head are ushered out of the room to make space for a sensation you'll never name. It doesn't last, and as your eyes open and the light fades, you have your first linguistically structured thought in what seems like a long time. I've only got, like, one hour to live. Now, as far as hypotheticals go, I'm not really a fan of the old you-have-one-hour-to-live scenario. It's too familiar, too easy. The answers are too often preached by drunk kids in yellow t-shirts or self-proclaimed simple folk who just want to go 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. But the scenario does bring with it an interesting prompt on the imperatives of living. When the number of variables that we can do with our lives are shortened and limited, the question, what will you do with your life, suddenly becomes attainable. It's honest, it's easy, and maybe even intuitive. Of course, when we extend the time scale from one hour to a day, or a year, or a lifespan, or the anticipated lifespans of your children, or all of humanity, our organic calculators, our brains, lose track of the variables. We can't figure it out. It seems way too far out of reach. This is a question that, at least on that huge scale, seems so far out of reach, and yet it has never stopped being asked or answered, I think. We have attempted to answer it with poetry and with art and with ethics and religious rituals, which is about every story there is and every expression and every movie barely even veiled is this question. What are we supposed to do with our lives? But is it really so out of reach? Can we as individuals truly live entirely the way we should live. If we draw a map where on one end is everything we could ever want out of our short lives, and on the other end is where we are now, the circumstances that surround us economically, geographically, romantically, socially. Over here is if we choose to stay in Seattle or move to New York. Over here is if we decide to ask that coworker out. Here is taking time to be informed about world issues, or maybe instead of that, learning the flute. <laughs> All of these choices influence the path we're on, either splitting us off and away from a fulfilled life, or towards it. But with enough truth, with enough understanding, is it possible to expand our field of view large enough to set a route through the field of variables and wind up on the other side? Can we truly direct our paths with? purpose, or are we as individuals and amateurs just leaves in the wind? I'm a leaf on the wind. What does that mean? The sheer volume of data that's out there should probably imply to us that no one person can track and direct all those choices entirely. While in the past genius could encompass art and astronomy and physics all at the same time, now information is enormous, it's bountiful. The experts these days are in increasingly specified. There may be experts in ancient Turkish sexuality, but there are no experts in life. Life has become too complicated with discoveries about ancient Turkish sexuality, or Zen aesthetics, or theoretical physics. We've, we've kind of lost our gurus. On the other hand, we live now in a time where knowledge has never become more attainable. The availability of information isn't better than it's ever been. Is it worth it now for an individual to at least try to achieve this bird's eye kind of wisdom or is that even how we reach fulfillment so when i was 17 i started a journal i had just finally identified the obsession that kept me awake as a child and it was this obsession how should we truly live and in that journal it became about truth and at the time it really was just that vague uh truth with a capital t it seems naive now, but genuinely, I, I didn't know what I was looking for, though I think I was seeking 
the kind of truth that I sensed from religion and philosophers, the kind that filled people with purpose and certainty, the kind that directed and, and justified your actions and enriched every beautiful thing with some kind of foundation. I was certain it was out there, waiting for me, and when I found it, I would <laughs> wedge open my skull and replace my brain with it. I think I was lucky. I didn't feel much homage to pay to any particular religious background, and so the only criteria for truth that I had was that it seemed right to me, that it seemed uh, reasonable, that I could use it and use it reliably. In the long term, I hoped that whatever it was, it would be big enough to contain <laughs> everything in life, but small enough to hold in my hands, to own it. That journal became thick with facts and frustrations because up until that point, curiosity had flooded everything in my mind. It had tormented me that so many of the answers I found from friends, from mentors, from books came absent of that curiosity, that courtesy to let unknown things remain unburied by certainty. There were too many certain people, certain of their gods or their rights or their roles or their words. It felt like it, it felt like every great encompassing idea that humanity ever had was careless in this way. At the same time, I was falling in love with science and philosophy. And when I started, I dabbled with uh, Protestants and Catholics and Marxism and Taoism and then Sagan and Feynman and then Russell and Hitchens and Watts and Wittgenstein and Nietzsche until one incarnation of that obsession led me here to YouTube where I charged myself with spouting science toward religious fundamentalists and logic towards pseudo-philosophers and the good name of all things rational and recent to me. I was enamored with knowledge then, but I wielded it like a stolen rifle. I was cocky and incompassionate. I was showing it off and I didn't know what to do with it. I pulled away from that channel, this channel, some years ago. It was exhausting being that certain, speaking to others who were also certain. Certainty, I decided, does not precede enlightenment, nor does it really follow it. Enlightenment, the good kind, only exists when sandwiched between curiosity and even more curiosity. I turned back towards exploration. I traveled aimlessly, I danced, I ate good food, and I kissed pretty people. My journal became more like a real journal, detailing the days my feelings, the personal profundities of everyday life. I realized that as the total number of things I knew rose, so did the number of questions I had. My, my dream of containing it, fulfilling it, was getting further and further away the more I explored. And at the same time, the specific words and phrases of all these thinkers and theories were beginning to slip away from me, the way you can forget the face of a good friend when too much time has passed between visits. Eventually, I came up with one abstraction to patch this crack. If we return to that original anecdote on the mountaintop and the visualization of traveling along the string of choices, we can notice a kind of cliché understanding of life's path. We usually imagine someone's life like this, a single line that begins with birth and ends with death, and the point furthest to the right represents you. And more importantly, that's you experiencing your own life. But both the fields of neuroscience and history have showed us that the past is hardly a solid, reliable piece of our identity. Our memories aren't perfect. In fact, we have pretty awful memories, which begin to fade almost immediately after the experience. So let's shorten that line up quite a bit, and let's change the direction of it, because we don't get to look back on the past as it was. We invent our memories. It isn't like a, a jet stream that follows behind us. It's more like a broken fire hydrant spewing a story backwards in time from the present. And this reminds me of a really cool quote from Augustine. He said, 
What now is clear and plain is that neither future things nor past things exist. Nor is it properly said there are three times, past, present, and future. Yet it might possibly be properly said there are three times a present of things past, a present of things present, and a present of things future. For these three things do exist in some way in the mind, but I do not see them elsewhere. The present of things past is memory. The present of things present is sight. The present of things future is expectation. So let's also stop sliding the spot along the line. The spot is stationary in the present. It will always ever be now. But of course you're bigger than that spot, aren't you? Now I'm not talking about like a soul or a past life or something like that. I'm just pointing out that a biological sensory experience isn't the only defining feature of your identity. Our identities are extremely complex. We don't just experience our own lives, we literally experience the lives of others through direct empathy or allegory. There were these existentialist thinkers like Sartre and Levinas who explored this, who led many to understand our personhood as a combination of both self and other. The inseparability of an individual from their social influences. Most of the things that make you distinctly you originating from something other than you. The language you speak, the customs you've ritualized, the stories you've internalized. Certain schools of psychology and phenomenology, uh, I think it's gestalt therapy, only recently began agreeing with what uh, I think Eastern philosophies have been saying for centuries. Uh, I'll give you two quotes. Without the other, there is no self, and how one experiences the other is inseparable from how one experiences oneself. That's from the Encyclopedia of Theory and Practice in Psychotherapy and Counseling. Compare that with a poem from a Zen master back in the 13th century who said that the self advances and confirms 10,000 things is called delusion that 10,000 things advance and confirm the self is called enlightenment. And somewhere in the middle of that, we have Alan Watts who said, we seldom realize, for example, that most of our private thoughts and emotions are not actually our own, for we think in terms of languages and images which we did not invent, but were given to us by our society. This may also be explored as an evolutionary trait of a social species, to directly experience the emotional or physical experiences of another through observation. Neuroscientists like this name that I'm not going to try to pronounce suggest that the ability for mere neurons to fire in your own brain when observing another makes empathy more akin to remote perception. We literally feel what others feel and then are told by our other nerves and the rest of our body, it's okay, don't worry, this isn't happening to you. And so even though we may want to think we travel forwards on our timelines, it might be more reasonable to suggest we also extend them backwards. We learn about our families and then our communities. Soon we learn about the history of our country and back and back, and not only back, but up as well because we're learning not about events, but about thoughts of people from centuries ago. Calculus, democracy, empiricism. We can also experience abstractions, fantasies, hypotheticals, and then we can extend ourselves forwards into hopes and predictions. What this ends up looking like is that our identities do not progress forward linearly over time, but rather they expand in every direction from the present expanding into history, into the metaphysical, into national identity or global identity or gender identity or biological identity, forwards and backwards and sideways. And that goal, that everything we wanted out of life, we may never reach it because we're no longer moving. But if we're lucky, we can realize it always existed in the present, as a present of things future. And maybe we grow so big that some tangible version of that gets sucked in like air around a forest. 
and it becomes us. So I finished that journal last year, closing it with a letter to my 17-year-old self. And in it, I told him about that journey and about those epiphanies. And I thanked him for not silencing that relentless wonder, for giving it space to run. But I corrected his vision of it. There is no state of fulfillment, a point when, when the web of identity stops and you become who you are who you always wanted to be, or you realize the truth with a capital T. There's something much better, a state of constant expansion, of constant wonder. Those little branches at the end, budding and splitting and growing leaves. Wonder can have two meanings, I think. Puzzlement is the first, a sort of confusion and curiosity. And then there's wonder, awe, marvel, amazement. I told him wonder is not a stepping stone. It isn't the bus fare you pay towards knowledge. It's the reverse. It's the opposite. Knowledge is the process. Wonder is the result. Wonder is a bungalow by the sea where you can rest with friends and admire the stars as we tumble past them. Wonderment doesn't get fulfilled. Wonderment is fulfilling. And so to celebrate that, I've started this, my new journal, and this time I invite you along. So here I'll be cataloging these sort of abstractions and little epiphanies. And I'm not an expert in most of this stuff. I do try to base these on as reliable sources as I can find. All my references will be in the description. But I'm not so much interested in the just, did you know facts? I'm more interested in, in meandering to dark, mysterious corners and, and building fires and tracing shapes in the glimmer, finding beauty and living with it until I swallow it up. So this is a series. It has 12 episodes every Thursday. I'll be exploring a, a strange new topic and attempting to own it, to hold it in my hands. We'll look at uh, etymology of, of non-theism, pop nihilism, visual epistemology, depression, Fermi's paradox, psychology of modern music, emergent divinity, uh, paradoxes of truth and time, relationship mapping, and much more. All the music that you hear is my original music, available for download. All the art is my own, that's my hand there, hi. This is my voice, uh, and I'll be around to answer questions and hear your input. I want this to be interactive. Tell me your thoughts. Share your ideas with me as well. My name is A Human. I love to think and draw and write and compose and explore and laugh. And right now, 